it took me a long time before making my <laughs> uh, first feature film. Um, a little bit by choice, but also <laughs> by accident. Um, I was unhappy with my shorts. I thought they were silly, they were immature, and I wanted to, to work only on a project which I wanted to do. I needed to learn about life. It's what my wife told me. I said, it's, I mean, those shots are well made, but they are childish. Uh, so, I think taking care of my children, being with my wife, I learn a lot of things. Working as a press agent, meeting directors, and again, I have to repeat that, when I work with Pierre, first, uh, Georges de Borgard, with a lot of people of the new wave, then as a freelance press agent, when I work as a freelance press agent with Pierre Rissian, we worked only on the film we liked, we loved. We, we transformed the job of press agent in, <laughs> in a way, in a, in a film buff work. Yes. And I met a lot of great directors. I mean, spending times with John Ford, with Howard Hawks, with Carol Rice, uh, with Francesco Rosi, uh, with Claude Chabrol or Jean-Luc Godard, uh, and, and many other people with Raoul Walsh, was very, very re rewarding. Meeting uh, Joe Lossi, Abe Polonsky, and that. <laughs> that was great. But I still wanted to be, to be a film director, and I wrote screenplays. Yeah. And I had one project which was accepted by two actors. It was an adaptation of The Beach of Faleza, uh, which I gave to uh, Jacques Brel and James Mason. Mm -hmm. And they both accepted to, to do it. Uh, uh, Mason saying, told, even told me that it was the best adaptation of, of the Stevenson novella that he ever read. And then a producer, Pierre Bromberger, um, tricked me. He, he took an option on that and uh, on, on the screenplay and he gave it to another director. <laughs> and the project fell apart. I try after that to do a film about the French Gestapo, which was a taboo subject in the French cinema. And uh, I, I uh, wrote also an adaptation of an Alexandre Dumas novel, and later on it became my second film, Let the Joy Reign Supreme. We started from that screenplay and wrote an original screenplay. Yeah. So I worked a lot. It's not that I didn't, didn't try. I tried, but when I brought my, uh, what I had written about the French Gestapo to uh, two screenwriters, Jean Orange and Pierre de Bost, uh, we at that time had been very much attacked by the new wave and had no project. And I brought that film to them because of the films I saw, all the films they had written which I saw, especially the film during the occupation. And because they knew that period, they knew the occupation, uh, and, I, I, and I felt they could give me uh, a lot of wonderful uh, ideas. And I, I, I will come back on that later on, but I mean the, uh, the choice of Orange and Bost. But Pierre Bost rejected the project. He said, it's too dangerous. I mean, we are dealing with people who torture Jews, who kill, torture, who behave like monsters, who work 
absolutely hand in hand with the German Gestapo. And making a film about them will, even if we take all the precautions, there, there will still a risk of transforming them into heroes, into in making them appealing in, in, a, in a bizarre way. And Boss says, I don't want that. I mean, they are uh, Bonnie and Lafon, the creator of what we call La Carlingue, where practically most of the well-known French gangsters w w uh, uh, worked there. I mean, the place where Rue Lauriston, where they tortured, killed, raped, robbed thousands of people. I mean, we cannot make heroes out of them, or even making them interesting will be. So, I, a few weeks after, I, <laughs> I went again to, see, to meet Orange and Bost with another idea, which was the adaptation of um, Georges Simenon, with uh, 40 pages which I had written. So, that was the idea. In fact, I wanted to wait until I felt that I was prepared, not technically, but, um, how do you say, emotionally? I mean, in my, uh, in my way of thinking, in my approach to life, I, f I felt I needed to be... Uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't want to do a first feature which would be uh, I mean, taking an uninteresting subject and trying to make something glossy out of it. Yeah. I had to be committed very, very deeply, very emotionally, and, and I found that. Uh, I had found that with the Stevenson story, I had found that with the, <laughs> the Gestapo film, but m even more with the, the, the Simnon novel. Um, I certainly wanted to behave in the opposite way of Jean-Pierre Melville. Um, I, have, I have, I had, and I still have a great admiration for Melville. I think he's a tremendous director. Uh, people are now praising uh, all his film noir, but there are something f sometimes forgetting films like Léon morin Prête or Les Enfants Terribles, which are very, very beautiful films too and very daring film, for me better than uh, Le Cercle Rouge. But Melville on the set, at least, I worked on one film, which was Léon morin Prête, was horrific. I mean, the way he liked to, um, he could be, uh, he could be also very charming. Yeah. I mean, he could put you in, in his pocket like that. I mean, it's, uh, and I owe him, a lot of things. He and Claude Sauté were my two godfather. Uh, but Melville on the set loved to humiliate people. He loved, for instance, when he disagreed with uh, a wallpaper in a room. <laughs> Instead of coming very early in the morning um, and trying to have the wallpaper change before everybody comes. He was arriving at the last minute. When we were supposed to start at noon, he was arriving at noon. Always saying, I say hello the first day, I will never say hello the rest of the shooting because it's a gain of time. And he had even calculated how many minutes. <laughs> he was saving that way. <laughs> and then he was saying, oh, I don't like that wallpaper. It's not the wallpaper I ask. And it could be a very, very bad face and, and a lie. But he was calling the production designer, calling all the crew, and he was starting to cut with his razor the wallpaper very slowly. I mean, I saw the humiliation of a, a production designer for 45 minutes in front of the crew, and I thought myself, if, if I become a film director, I solemnly swear I will not behave that way. I mean, I, I hated coming on the set in a, with a, 
like if I was going to a, 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 math, a mathematic course. Mm -hmm. I mean, I felt tight and frightened, like if I was going either to the gym or to, the, to, to mathematics. I said, I, I should, normally I should enjoy doing this. And I, I talked with some people who, who uh, I, had, I had met Jean Renoir. I met Jean Renoir. I, I talked with actors who had worked with him and who explained the way he was handling actors and Marcel Pagnol and people like that. It's true, in France, in the 30s and the 40s, most of the directors were tyrant, yelling, I mean, uh, and screaming against everybody. Very often because the producer were very, very tough and, and the stars were um, some opinionated and sometimes difficult. I mean, the situation had changed with the new wave. The actors were easier. The, the fight with the producer were less frequent. I never had any on my film, or very few. Very, very few. I was most of the time very free on the set. And I decided to, to try to create an atmosphere of pleasure, to have, to have fun. I mean, that doesn't prevent you of working very hard. Most of, our, I mean, I, most of my films are do done with a very, very limited budget and a limited schedule. I mean, The Clockmaker is done on 36 days. It was shot very, very, very fast. But we always had a lot of fun. And yes, I encourage collaboration, but I decide at the end. Uh, uh, um, ultimately, there will be only one person who would, uh, um, we will make the final decision, and it will be me. But I don't want. I mean, there are two schools in here, and I met those two directors. You have the schools, which uh, I would say, uh, I will call that the Jean de Vevre school because he is the one who formulated. Uh, the, the best, the, the concept. When I asked him, if somebody proposed you an idea, he said, I reject it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want even to consider it, because if I, uh, I didn't have that idea, that meant that I didn't work well enough. Well, that, yeah. And the other concept is Jean Renoir, during La Grande Illusion, working on the scene, that moment where Jean Gabin and Marcel Dalio are uh, splitting. They are, they, they are leaving each other in the snow. And there was a long dialogue. And Spack had written it, and it didn't work. Jean Renoir rewrote it, and it was not working. And then Jean Gabin came, Gabin said, he says, you know, Jean, I think I should sing, or Dalio should sing, a song, instead of giving those lines, he should go away saying, il était un petit navire, il était un. And, Gap, and Renoir said, wonderful. So it's an idea of Gabin, but because Renoir has the genius of accepting it, it becomes an idea of Renoir. That's the difference between Renoir and the other director of the same period. He immediately understand that this, this idea is better than was in the screenplay. And that I believe, I believe that. And that's something to which a new wave brought to, that the screenplay was very important and, it, and we must work and work on the screenplay. And on that, I am of the school of Jacques Becker, of Ophuls, of that. But at the same time, I must be prepared to incorporate any accident, any idea which will be better than the screenplay. And just oh, Orange and Boss, just wonder if you could say a little bit more about your relationship with them. I mean, just given you know that Truffaut in particular, very cri critical of them. They were associated with Le, Le Cinema du, du Papa. You, mm -hmm. as 
um, as, as a publicist, as, as, a, as, a, as a young filmmaker, you were close to, to Kaye, close to, to the new wave. So in a sense, you had a, a foot in both camps. Um, yeah. Just wondered what your colleagues, your contemporaries thought about your relationship with Orange and Bost. I mean, whether the likes of Truffaut and, and Godard was, were, were surprised. And uh, uh, I, I never mentioned that with, uh, with Godard. When I met Truffaut later on, he said, I made a mistake. I mean, the man I should have attacked was Autant Lara, not, not Orange. But he said that to me, maybe to please me. Mm -hmm. Because he wrote to several friends, to Pierre William Glenn, to me, some good things about the clockmaker and let the genre reign supreme. Yeah. And Sunday in the Country, which was based on Boss novel. I mean, um, but but when I I said that I was going to use them, immediately uh, uh, I saw some articles uh, saying that I chose them um, to rehabilitate them and to 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 make an anti new wave statement. This is mad. I mean, I must say, I mean, to be. Uh, a bit rude, I said, only a critic can write that. I mean, if I want to make a statement to fight for Orange or Boss, I, I will write an article. I will not spend, which was three years of my life, to prove a point. Yeah. I mean, especially that the people who were writing that were the same who after that saw that Laissez Passer was an attack against the new wave. I mean, that was so absurd. I mean, they, those, the people who write that do not know that I worked on that five films of Godard, which I really fought for those films. I worked nine times with Claude Chabrol. I was with Agnès Varda, with Jacques Demy. But at the same time, even when I was a film buff, I still liked some film of the 50s, and I saw the people who had been unfair. But if you look carefully, Truffaut praise La Traversée de Paris and En Cas de Malheur. Uh, it, it's a little bit more complex. Truffaut praised a film by Duvivier, which is a masterpiece called Voici le Temps des Assassins. But the reason why I took Orange and Bost was I, I needed for the clockmaker to work with, I wanted to work with a screenwriter. I decided to avoid all the people who are fashionable. As a press agent, I'd work with some directors and I've seen the, the problem they had working with successful screenwriters. Uh, Jean-Claude Carrière or Pascal Jardin, or that, who at those times were working on three, four, five films at the same time and devoting very little time to each project. Mm. And I thought, I thought uh, uh, about uh, people who have used writers, screenwriters who were on the blacklist. And it was the year where suddenly Ring Larner Jr. was coming back with MASH, where uh, Dalton Trumbo, the uh, Don Lonely are the Brave, Exodus, and Spartacus. I mean, all the Waldo Sad Midnight Cowboy. And I said, I should do the same. Yeah. The second point, my film is about a generation conf conflict. And I said, I, I thought that I should work with people who are not my age. That would be something interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, remembering what Billy Wilder once told me, he said, the screenwriter should be the minister of the opposition. He should, uh, he said, I work myself, I work with Charles Brackett, and we were totally opposite. A Jewish Democrat from uh, 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 from Germany or Vienna, and uh, a WASP, uh, conservative Protestant WASP, yeah. and then we did the film we did together, and I saw that it was a good idea. So I decided to look at many films done in the fifties and the forties, and I immediately notice two names. I decided to avoid Henri Janson, who was too brilliant, sometimes wonderfully brilliant, 
but very often in his films, the, the actors were uh, <laughs> always reciting Henri Janson's line. But I remarked and noticed the work of Maurice Auberger, who would work several times with Jacques Becker. And we had done several great screenplays, like La Vérité for Bébé d'Ange, Henri de Coin. And then I saw most of the film of Orange and Boss, and it was a shock. Because when there was something bad in the film, I can say that 80% of the time it was because of the direction, not the screenwriting. I saw the screenwriting was modern, that they were not adding punchline for the pleasure to have a punchline. They were sometimes literary, but in a beautiful way. And most of it, they were brave. And I saw especially several films done during, between 1940 and 1944. And in one of them called Douce by Claude Autant-Lara, which is, I must say, one of the masterpieces of the period. A very, very beautiful and meaningful film. In Douce, there is a scene which I pay a tribute to in Laissez Passer, in which the character, played by Marguerite Moreno, a countess, uh, pays a visit to some, a very poor family, to bring woods, to bring a little bit of boiled beef. And when she goes out, she says, I wish you patience and resignation. Patience and resignation were the two words used all the time by Maréchal Pétain on the radio. And Roger Pigot, who is playing the young farmer, after, goes after her and says, you should have wished impatience and revolt. And I, I decided that I wanted to know the two people who, in 1942, when my country was occupied, wrote those two words, impatience and revolt. I, uh, we talk very often about people being brave, being courageous. Most of the time, those words are very ill-used, badly used. No. I mean, there they have a meaning, because writing those two words, which the audience was immediately understanding, and during the four weeks, five weeks, the film was released, that line was provoking applause at every, um, every, every day, every screening. And then the censorship <laughs> discovered it and they cut the scene. They cut the scene, which was replaced uh, in 1945. But I wanted to meet them. So it's not, I decided to, 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 to try to work with them, first because they were, I felt they were good. They could give me something, their experience, their life. And that meeting was extraordinary. I met two of the most wonderful human beings uh, of my life. And then I, <laughs> Pierre Boss died. Uh, just after the clockmaker, um, out of sorrow, his wife died, and he was so much in love with, with her that he could not uh, accept to be alone, and he, he died. And I stayed with Jean Orange, and we worked on several films together. And um, they were, at least Orange, in the person who is <laughs> it's the opposite of uh, the description that, I mean, when, when people talk about the film of that period, they said cinéma de papa. I mean, Orange was a complete anarchist. He was somebody who had been close to the Surrealist Party. He had been uh, his, his uh, sister married um, Max Ernst and then Soutine, and he was close with the, again, with Sandré Breton, with the Surrealist, with the Surrealist Party. He's, uh, 
uh, it started in the cinema by doing crazy uh, um, commercials uh, with with in, I use one of them in in Coutorchon, in Clean Slate, and in the one I use, you have Max Ernst, Picasso, Artegas. You have the most extraordinary people in uh, in a commercial about the Galerie Barbès, about furniture. I mean, he did his first film was a documentary he, uh, about a, a fisherman f fishing with dynamite, which was forbidden, and it's so. It's the opposite of a cinema shot in studio. And all his life, Orange begged for the film to be shot on location for a kind of, um, I mean, when we were working on the screenplay together, Let the Drone Ryan Supreme, he, he was the one who told me, forget about the plot, forget the structure. Let, we will write for our pleasure. Let's write anything which amuses us. And out of that, something will come. But no, no theatrical construction. Let's, let's, let's have fun. And, and I, I found that Orange was one of the freest men I've ever, I've ever met. The, it's very often the directors and the production system who transform a screenplay into something more, uh, I would say, conventional or more uh, uh, give some, something which had um, a shape, uh, a shape, a construction, a stronger construction. But Orange was was uh, and bossed sometimes. I mean, was the person who was <laughs> regulating <laughs> the enthusiasm of Orange. He was moderating <laughs> that. <laughs> I love Simon. I think he's one of the greatest French novelists. In, in some novels, he deals with politics. Um, sometimes not in a very politically correct way. But I mean, it, some of the book of the 30s are um, have um, anarchists, have people who are outside the, 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 the who are, um, I, I would say, uh, <laughs> um, heroes, which marginal heroes. But he dealt mostly with, with he avoided sometimes politics, and, and sometimes, <laughs> and sometimes, I must say, um, what he wrote in some novels, in some, uh, uh, was uh, dubious. His attitude during the occupation was not completely clear. Not completely clear. But there was one thing, and, and then because of that, he decided to, um, to devote one or two books to, to, to uh, anti-Semitism. And he did. Le Petit Homme d'Archangesque is a beautiful book about anti-Semitism. Um, there, on, there was one subject in Simeno where he always was political. And since his first days, that was colonialism. Simeno, as a journalist, gave some uh, articles, some essays, which were devastating, very, very violent. One was called um, a dead every f five meters, something like that. It's about the construction of railroad in, uh, in the Congo. And this, I mean, <laughs> this is like Albert Londres. This is uh, one of some of the most, and André Gide, those are uh, the devastating uh, description of the violence of colonialism, the, the way the, 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 the African workers are treated. And he wrote many things, many, many uh, essays about it, and all the books which are dealing with that, which take place in Tahiti, uh, in the South Seas, or in Africa, 
speak about that. They speak about the white man as a total foreigner, the understanding nothing about Africa or Polynesia, and uh, behaving sometimes very badly, stealing, murdering, killing. So, uh, so Simon uh, dealt a few times with politics, and I had told him that I would transform um, the screenplay, too, and he didn't care. He didn't care. Um, he thought his, his great model for him was Chekhov. And two, the, the things which he was, which he said he always tried to, to get in all his book, um, it was w what he calls l'homme nu, the naked man, which means the essence of the man when you have taken off all the clothes, all the, the civilization, what, what civilization covers. And, and you have that in, in most of his novels. And it's what fascinates me. And very often, Simon has been reduced to something very, very superficial. The atmosphere, the fog, the wet cobblestone. I think what is important in Simon, in those moments, a few moments in the book where you have an impression of getting the art of the matter, the essence of the man, the naked man. There is one moment like that in the book which I try to capture in the film. It's uh, when the character of the clockmaker has learned that his son has committed a murder. Uh, he goes back to his flat. He walks in his flat. He enters his son's bedroom and he lies down on the bed of his son. I mean, that I found that incredibly moving, that moment. And for me, that's Simno. It's the man who, in, who write about a moment like that. It's what I cherish in Simno and what I try to preserve, even if we were changing the plot even if we are changing first the place, the book takes place in America, and I chose my native town, Lyon, because I felt at ease there. And I had the, 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 the political context, but, but some of Simon's novel had the same kind of context. And in a way, his stories are so so deep that they accept very easily the context that you will had. It's, 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 it's exactly like Chekhov. I will never make a statement about the press in general. Yes. I mean, you cannot put in the same bag the, the people who write about movies yeah. and the people who write about crime and the people who write about politics. Yeah. I mean, there are three different worlds. Yes, yes. I mean, you, we, we had, uh, well as had in, in France, um, some great, great journalists. Uh, I mean, you had some uh, too in, in England. And you have a press which, I don't know, how do you call, we, we, in France we call presse de caniveau, it's in the... the you, gutter press. Gutter, we have, when they, they are talking about um, uh, the, the, the crime, the things like that, they are so very often offensive yeah. and intrusive and that. It's, and it's not the same than some, uh, the, let's say, uh, uh, theater or film critic. Yeah. I mean, the, the good or bad points of the of, of film critic are totally different of the people who will write. Uh, uh, and that's, it's something which, I mean, in those days, it was after 68, I had witnessed uh, again, uh, again how certain, uh, cer certain deaths had been treated in, in, in those kind of medias. Yeah. I mean, in, uh, uh, 
in, in a very offensive way. So I wanted to speak about that. I wanted to make a statement about that. I mean, in the way they used, uh, they used that, uh, that was a good way to not to speak about so, some issues. And, and, and it, it, it has, <laughs> it's something which has not stopped. I mean, when, in, in, in 2002, when there was an election, I mean, um, the right-wing press spoke a lot about uh, drug dealing, crime committed by the, the immigrants. Uh, they, they put that, the first page of some newspaper. They put, I, mean, I mean, some TV channel close to the right-wing. I mean, open all his news with, with, with something like that, with a crime. And in order to get a vote, uh, that was a way of influencing the vote in order to, st to, to state um, a climate of fear uh, in the population. I mean, it's, 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 it's always the same. So that I wanted to, and, and Orange was insisting on that because, I mean, he, even more than me, he had been used to that kind of press during the the, the 40s, the 50s, or even the 30s. Uh, so that, that was a way of attacking what, what, something which is often disgusting in the media. I mean, it's uh, uh, because you, you, the fact of the importance given to a crime <laughs> will prevent some uh, TV channel to speak about a strike, which mm -hmm. is which is happening uh, 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 200 meters away. I mean, that's, uh, so that's, uh, but it's not, let's say, I'm, I try to avoid general ideas and general statements. I will never think that the whole press, the whole media are bad. I mean, I had some, have a lot of admiration for many people many, many, many people. So it's just that uh, <laughs> it, it was a, a, a moment of anger against um, bad behavior. We established a cold rapport, rapport because I owe him my career. I mean, he was the first actor which I contacted with my 40 pages treatment for the clockmaker. Invite me to lunch. At the end of the lunch, he says, yes, I want to do it. And then during two years, we were turned down by everybody in Paris. Turned down, insulted, humiliated. Sometimes really humiliated by people who are looking at us and just weighing <laughs> the script and saying, it's too big. Not even opening it. And he stayed with me. Those two years. He never came back on his word. He accepted to do the film at half of his price. And we didn't talk a lot about that. One day I asked him, I said, but Philippe, I mean, uh, after six months, I would have understood you just calling me and says, we will never make it, I, w I will do something else. Why? And he said, uh, I had given my word. And I think is, I mean, Philippe no, I was, he's, I know, I hate to speak to him in past tense. A gentleman. And, um, and that creates a link. Uh, and I told him during the clockmaker, I said, he, he came to me one day, he said, um, it's very strange, I've done a lot of first film, but I don't do s second feature of a director. I said, do you want, can we make a bet? Because I thought at that time, about let the joy reign supreme. And uh, I mean, to answer your question, 
on the set, no, on, on the set it does, it's, it, it will not change the dialogue. It will not, uh, sometimes it can come with an, an idea of moving differently in the scene. There are very, very, very few um, lines which are added. Some in the restaurant and the, in, the, in the opening scenes at, 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 at the end was a, a little bit of impro. The end of the fight, too, there was a little bit of... Uh, ad but most of, most of, of what of his contribution will happen before, in working on the screenplay, reading the screenplay with me. We'll say, you can cut that line, I can play those words. I mean, uh, or um, change that, can we change that adjective? And, uh, that, um, and, and sometimes giving good ideas, but most of the time, he loves to accept a challenge. I mean, that, uh, so, he contributes, but he contributes uh, by um, giving ideas about the clothes, the, the props he will use, the, the, way, the, the way to, he will use them. And that became more and more important with all, all the film. And the relationship, I mean, I would say it, it, it was a... It was a, a, a beautiful relationship. I think we, we like to be together. He had a way of working which I found great. He was doing everything to give the impression that what he was doing was easy. <laughs> For instance, very often he, he was arriving on the set, he says, what does what is the scene where I'm supposed to to be in? Oh, I don't remember anything. I should uh, I should I should read the, the. I mean that was bullshit. He knew perfectly well, but he wanted to give the impression that uh, that he just had to read it for thirty seconds, and then uh, went, I mean it was easy because he knew it by heart. But uh, I've seen some American actors which who ask for um, five minutes of silence, silence to, to concentrate themselves. I mean, who ask nobody to, in the eye line that everybody should be uh, uh, still. On, uh, I mean, Philippe Noiret and Jean Rochefort and Michel Galabro and Jean, they are not like that. I mean, they, they, they it's, they have more, fun. they consider all that as a bit ridiculous. Mm. It says a good actor should, I mean, it's better if everything is quiet, but I mean, uh, they should be ready to work by, in any kind of circumstance, any kind of uh, uh, um, environment. And, and be ready to give everything and not... <laughs> Noir, I find that very bizarre, the fact that many American actors ask for their motivation. Mm. He says, if, if you have done your homework, you know that. It's because he has been a long time a theater actor, that he has been confronted to a lot of different um, plays, a lot of different uh, writers, I mean Shakespeare, Chekhov, Corneille, Victor Hugo, uh, Lope de Vega, Calderon, Brecht, uh, Schiller. I mean, he, he has a culture. I mean, I was dealing with an actor who was educated, who had a tremendous, who, when he's reading a text immediately, he understands the meaning, the of the words. I mean, he's a little bit like Ron Carter, who in the jazz musician is very educated. He reads an orchestration and it takes him 20 seconds to understand every note. And then he reads a book while all the people are practicing. He reads and he has the time to read two books by uh, every day of recording. <laughs> I mean, the, the noir is like that. And, and so, I mean, it was, it was a pleasure. We were having a lot of fun.
but he, he brought ideas in films. Yeah. I mean, I'm especially thinking of Life and Nothing But, which was a film which was very personal to him. Uh, I can give you a, a good example. Uh, uh, there was a scene w which was describing um, some families coming up in a field and in in the field, there is a table. On the table, you have a lot of objects. I mean, taken on some dead bodies. And the families come to see if they can recognize a, a clock, a medal belonging to one of their relatives. In the screenplay, it was written that it was a day of November, misty, rainy, cloudy. When we arrived in that field, it was totally sunny. And I had a moment of despair. I said, <sighs> and Philip came to me and says, Tonton, shoot! Why? There is no reason why um, a funeral should all, always take place during a rain. I mean, shoot it with the sun. It will be less conventional. It will be closer to John Ford. <laughs> uh, and, and it will be even more dramatic to have those people coming and seeing all those macabre things with a beautiful sun and a great, great light. And he pushed me, he forced me to work, and, that, and, and he was right. So uh, we had that kind of furniture, which very often we didn't need any words. He was looking at me and he said, OK, don't uh, another one, just by looking at me. He told me later on, after five days on the clockmaker, that before starting, he was a little bit afraid <laughs> of the fact that I was a film buff. That I, I was going to direct him with a lot of reference. I will ask that you must behave like in the shot of a film and imitate what so and so does. And he said after two days, he was completely reassured. I never made an allusion to another film. I was only speaking about the characters, the way he should behave, his attitude, how, how he was moving. And I never, never, never with him made any allusion to another film. We, we were only talking about, about the, the essence of the character.